Hi, so this is an experiment. Um, I would appreciate feedback on it. Um, uh, this is designed to give a little more uh, overview of the classic economic account of advertising, and in particular, the division of uh, things that you can look for in advertising into search experience and credence attributes. So starting with search attributes, uh, price is supposed to be a classic example of a search attribute. Um, the classic economic theory thus says that misrepresentations about price are irrational and unlikely. Um, because they're so easy to check. And yet, there might be circumstances under which it could make sense for an advertiser to falsely advertise price. Um, so the obvious scenarios are when total price is hard to determine. Um, this could be an instance of misleading rather than outright false advertising, but anything that's multi-component, um, some phone plans, some you know, university educations, uh, it can be hard to figure that out, in which case um, then there can be uh, an incentive to advertise at least incompletely. Likewise, bait and switch might be an example of when it would, could pay to falsely advertise price if you advertise something at a low price, um, but then say you're out of it and try and switch the consumer uh, to uh, a higher priced version, which they uh, uh, accept because they're short on time, they've got various sunk costs um, because you convince them otherwise, it could pay uh, to, to do bait and switch. In addition, uh, there are false discount claims um, that might uh, make sense to use. So consider the ad regularly $50, now $25. If the product ordinarily sells in fact for $25 or worse perhaps for $20, um, some would say that that kind of false advertising of a false discount can't be harmful to consumers because the consumer receives the advertised price. Um, but the research suggests otherwise, which is that people, uh, when they perceive a bargain, are, end up being more willing to buy. Uh, and so that could be a situation where the advertiser makes money from falsely advertising the presence of a discount. There are also anchoring effects. Consumers may believe the price is cheap because $50 has been mentioned as a plausible price for the product. Uh, and that could also improve, increase the incentive to cheat. Um, in fact, anchoring effects are so powerful that past research has demonstrated that if you ask students to, get, to write down the last two digits of their social security numbers and then ask them to bid on a product, they then anchor on those numbers. Obviously, one's social security number has no relationship to the market price of the product, but respondents can't help using it anyway as a reference point. Um, separately, consumers often think that high price means high quality and low price means low quality, even when that's not true. So it can benefit you to advertise that your product was initially a higher price. So already we're seeing that things can be pretty complicated. Um, just to go through the rest of the uh, divisions. Uh, an experience attribute is something that's verifiable after purchase as opposed to before purchase. The taste of bubble gum, the miles per gallon a, a car receives. Um, some people who argue that the market is self-correcting like Lillian Bevere say that people know that advertisers are likely to exaggerate and so won't believe experience claims either. So advertisers won't bother to falsify them. However, it can also make sense for an advertiser to falsely advertise an experience attribute. For example, if you're dealing with an expensive, uh, rare purchase item like a house or a car, uh, then fooling you once can be profitable enough. Um, a ticket to the fire festival. Uh, cases also exist in which you might turn out to like the experience even if it wasn't what you thought you wanted. This interacts with the psychological effects of advertising. If, as the research shows, advertising can affect your sensory experience, then it will definitely make sense to the advertiser to make false experience claims. People like salty orange juice more after they see an ad that says it tastes good, even though they say they're not affected by the ad. And a question is, is it wrong for the advertiser to try and change your beliefs through deception as long as you actually end up thinking that you've had a good time? possibly worth noting here, people still thought the orange juice was pretty bad. They just didn't think it was as bad as the people who hadn't seen the ad. Another example, perhaps a little more persuasive, uh, people like Pepsi more in blind taste tests, but they like Coke more in unblinded taste tests. They even like Coke in a labeled cup, 
better than they like Coke in an unlabeled cup. They are tasting the trademark. And one question we might ask is, does that actually mean that the claim that Pepsi tastes better than Coke is false? Or is it true because it's true when they're not labeled? One reason we might be vulnerable to manipulation about the experience of consuming a product is known as social proof. We're social animals and we're often inclined to believe that what other people say is true. Advertising can th therefore simulate the opinion of other people and even change our own memories and beliefs. Relatedly, mere repetition makes us more likely to believe uh, for various reasons that are re related to ordinary and probably useful heuristics. Um, that are common to most humans. There are many other ways to manipulate consumers. And one big question of this course is, what role can the law play in addressing these cognitive biases? The final category of attributes in the standard model is a credence attribute. Quality is impossible for the consumer to judge even post experience. Did the aspirin take away your headache or did the headache go away by itself? Is this good legal representation or bad? Uh, you know, did they get a result that anybody could have gotten uh, or a result that almost no one else could have gotten? Uh, Bevere says advertisers won't make credence claims either because they know consumers will discount such claims. And yet they're everywhere. And in class, we'll discuss a little bit why that is. One reason I'll offer is that even a rational skeptic might take a chance, uh, especially if there doesn't seem to be a better option. And the empirical evidence suggests that consumers aren't as skeptical of credence claims as the theory says they should be. Um, so uh, it's another example of not adhering to the rational actor model of the consumer. It's really hard to be a pure rational actor. Most of us have more enjoyable things to do most of the time than precisely calculate and calibrate our degrees of belief. And also, of course, unconscious effects may play a role. So the effect of ads on taste experience may also uh, give some information about credence, uh, how we respond to credence claims. Another complicating factor is that lots of claims about things that could be search or experience attributes are in fact credence claims. Lowest prices anywhere or better than the competing brand. People just aren't likely to invest time in trying all the options. Search is expensive. so most of these things end up as credence attributes, at least in part. Bevere discusses these types of attributes and consumer skepticism about them in order to argue that the market generally works well without government intervention. A core question that her work raises, which we will discuss in class, is what is it reasonable to ask consumers to do to protect themselves against false claims? So one possible analogy is strict product liability. Another possibility is negligence. Uh, consider, for example, whether it would make sense to ask who is the cheap, cheapest cost avoider when it comes to deception, and what kind of evidence would be relevant to deciding who is the cheapest cost avoider. So uh, that's it for now, and I will see you in class.